you've probably heard of Ozempic, Wagovi, Trulicity, you know, those weight loss drugs constantly in the news. Recently, scientists decided to test these same drugs called GLP-1s to slow down Parkinson's disease. Now, before you get too excited and run to your doctor, these drugs are not approved for Parkinson's yet. Uh, this is experimental at this time, but the research is fascinating. And I wanna explain what the scientists have found, both the successes and the failures. Hi, I'm Kim. I walked through the Parkinson's journey with my mom for many years. On this channel, I try to co translate complex medical research and information into plain English so that everyone can understand what's real and what's hype. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about what GLP-1 drugs actually are, why scientists think these drugs might help Parkinson's patients, the research results, including one major failure, whether or not you can get these drugs now, and why it's important to stay informed and remain hopeful. So have you heard about GLP-1s being tested for Parkinson's or is this new information for you? I wanna make this perfectly clear. I am not a doctor. I am just a normal person. Everything I share is based on research I've done. Please take this as educational information and always consult your neurologist before making any treatment decisions or changes. Okay, moving on. So what are GLP-1 drugs? GLP-1 stands for glucagon-like peptide 1, but everyone just calls them GLP-1 drugs. They were originally designed for type 2 diabetes. They help the body produce insulin and stabilize blood sugar. The first one that was approved for uh, diabetes was in 2005, and it was called exenatide. There are many that have been approved for diabetes since then. Some of the brand names you might recognize are Ozempic, Wagovi, Bayetta, Bidurion, Monjaro, Zetbound, Trulicity, Adlixin. Now Adlixin uh, is also known as Lixenatide, and that's important for this story because I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Okay, so why did these drugs become famous? Basically, people taking them for diabetes lost significant weight because these drugs reduce your appetite. They also have side effects like nausea and other digestive issues that curb the desire to eat. The interesting thing is that researchers found that these drugs don't just work in your pancreas and stomach as they previously thought. They also work in your brain. When the GLP-1 drugs activate brain receptors, they trigger effects that might help Parkinson's. Before we continue, I wanna ask you to please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any future information that I share. And also give this video a thumbs up if you're finding it valuable so far. Thank you so much. And I would also love to know if you or your loved one with Parkinson's already takes a GLP-1 for diabetes. And has your doctor or you noticed it helping with your Parkinson's symptoms? Please comment below. I would love to hear about that. Why would a diabetes drug help Parkinson's disease? GLP-1 receptors aren't just in your digestive system. They're scattered throughout your brain also, including areas affected by Parkinson's disease. When activated in the brain, they trigger neuroprotective effects, which are effects that protect your brain. So effect number one is that they improve energy production. Parkinson's damages the mitochondria, which are the tiny power plants in your cells. GLP-1 drugs help the mitochondria work more efficiently, giving cells the energy to survive. The second effect is fighting inflammation. Parkinson's causes chronic brain inflammation, which is ongoing irritation that damages cells. The GLP-1 drugs reduce this harmful inflammation. And effect number three, reducing oxidative stress. Cells produce waste products, which are called free radicals, that damage the cells over time. GLP-1 drugs boost natural antioxidant defenses to neutralize this damage. Effect number four, protecting against cell death. When dopamine cells are stressed, they can trigger self-destruction. The GLP-1 drugs help 
cells resist these death signals. So what's the connection? Energy problems, inflammation, and cell survival issues all happen in Parkinson's disease. So scientists gave the GLP-1 drugs to mice with Parkinson's-like symptoms. And guess what? Those animals improved. And that's why the human trials began. The first research using exenatide to, towards Parkinson's instead of diabetes was in 2017. It was a small trial. Researchers tested exenatide on 62 people with Parkinson's for 48 weeks. The results were positive. The exenatide group improved by one point on the motor scale, while the placebo group worsened by three points. That's a four point difference. This was meaningful, and the Parkinson's community was pretty excited. But then they did a larger trial. Because of those promising results, researchers ran a much larger phase three trial called the Exenatide PD3. This one had 194 people over 96 weeks. That's nearly two years. The results that were published in February of 2025 uh, were disappointing. Sadly, it didn't work. Both groups, exenatide and placebo, showed similar progression. The drug provided no meaningful benefit. Why did it fail? Well, there's a few reasons they don't really know exactly, but the, the smaller trial might have been a statistical fluke, could have used the wrong dose or wrong timing, exenatide doesn't cross into the brain well enough, or maybe it just doesn't have strong enough neuroprotective effects in humans. The Michael J. Fox Foundation said these results would just effectively close the door on exenatide for Parkinson's disease. But here's the critical point to remember. Just because exenatide didn't work doesn't mean all GLP-1 drugs won't work. These drugs have important differences in structure, duration, and brain penetration. That brings us to another research clinical trial on lixacenatide. A different drug, different results. So lixacenatide, adlixin, is in the same family as exenatide, but has a different molecular structure and it behaves differently in the brain. So the Park trial. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine 2024. So this consisted of 156 patients that had early Parkinson's disease. These patients received either lixacenatide or placebo daily for 12 months. The results were pretty good. Lixacenatide group, essentially no worsening, 0.04 points. The placebo group worsened by three points. That's a three point difference, which is clinically meaningful. This drug didn't cure anything, but people maintain stability. And in a progressive disease, that's significant. Why might lixacenatide work when exenatide didn't? Well, we're not really sure, but number one, better brain penetration. It crosses the blood brain barrier more effectively. Number two, longer duration of action. This drug stays active longer. Three was a different dosing schedule and four was different molecular structure. Small changes can make big differences. Think of them as slightly different keys for the same lock. One fits and turns better. There are some important caveats, however. This is still a phase two trial, so it's not definitive proof. Phase three trials are being planned now. There are some side effects, including nausea and digestive issues, which some patients may not be able to tolerate. And the timeline for this, results of this phase three trial probably be expected between 2028 and 2029. So that means the potential approval of this drug could be 2029 to 2031 at the earliest. So that leads us to our next question topic here. Can you get these drugs now? Short answer is no, and here's why. They're not FDA approved for Parkinson's, only for diabetes and weight loss. Most neurologists will not prescribe them. 
they will want to wait for proper evidence first and FDA approval. Insurance will not cover it, and these drugs cost hundreds or thousands of dollars per month. And we still don't know the right dose for Parkinson's or any of the long-term effects. But what you can do if you're interested in these drugs is ask your neurologist about clinical trials you might qualify for. Stay informed as research progresses. The easiest way is to stay subscribed to my channel because as soon as some updates come out, I'm going to post a video about it. And you also need to be patient. If these work, they'll be available and your doctor will know about them. Now, this is an important part of this video. How the scientists measure improvement. Researchers use the MDS UPDRS, which stands for Movement Disorder Society Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which is the gold standard. I made a video explaining this in detail. Um, this is the scale that the doctors use to rank patients' progression. And also, the researchers use this to determine whether or not a drug is effective. Now, I'll put a link to my video in the description. Um, of all the videos I've created, this one may be the most important one to watch. It explains a lot about how clinical trial data is used, um, how the different categories are broken up, and how doctors use it to track disease progression in patients. I also included a free worksheet in that video so that you could uh, do it at home. There are four main parts of the MDS UPDRS, and each part is broken down into uh, different questions that the doctor may ask or evaluate. Part one, non-motor daily living. Cognitive effects, mood, sleep, pain. Part two, motor daily living, which are the effects on speech, eating, dressing, handwriting, etc. Part three is the motor examination in office. So this is when you're in the doctor's office and he is basically observing tremor, stiffness, movement, speed, balance, etc. Part four are medication complications like dyskinesias which are involuntary movements, um, and your off-time experience. Off-time is when your medication has worn off and it's not time for the next dose, and usually the symptoms come back. Um, anyways, so there's four sections of the scale, and each item that they ask about or evaluate is rated on a score from zero, which is normal, to four, which is severe. Then they add up all the scores for all the parts and get a total score. And the total score ranges from zero, basically no effects at all, to 260, which means that you have every single thing that's affecting you. Now, clinical trials focus on part three. Part three is the motor examination in the, in the doctor's office. So that's their actual visually watching and observing the patient. They use this because it's the most objective and standardized. So a three to five point difference is clinically meaningful, which means if there's a three to five point difference in your total score, you would notice it in daily life. So an example with the lixacenatide clinical trial, the placebo worsened by 3.04 points. The lixacenatide group worsened by point zero, worsened by 0 0.04 points. That's a three point difference and that represents real functional preservation. So this is a kind of a big deal. Now here are some questions you can ask your doctor if you want more information um, directly from them. Number one, are you familiar with the GLP-1 research for Parkinson's? Number two, do you think this approach shows promise? Number three, are there clinical trials I might qualify for? And four, what would you want to see before considering this as a treatment for me? Now I'm going to put those questions down in the description so you don't need to write them down. But it's a good idea to have this discussion with your doctor. He knows you the best. Okay, now here's the bigger picture. 
GLP-1 drugs are just one strategy. Scientists are pursuing multiple approaches. There's other active research. I've done videos on most of these other treatments. You can go watch them after this. Um, protein targeting therapies, monoclonal antibodies for alpha-synuclein. Alpha-synuclein are the protein clumps in your brain that are responsible for causing Parkinson's disease. There are gene therapies, which boost dopamine production. Parkinson's is caused by a lack of dopamine in the brain. There are cell-based therapies, cell, stem cell transplants, vitamin trials, high-dose B3 showing potential. I just did a video on this one. It's super exciting information. You might want to watch that one for sure. And then novel drugs, which are designed specifically for Parkinson's disease. Why multiple approaches matter is because Parkinson's affects each person differently. Combination therapies might be the answer moving forward. Actually, experts predict that combination therapies, which means a variety of different treatments used all together, are the future for Parkinson's treatment. I also did a video about that. And another reason is because if one approach fails, there are other ones to try. Now, we learn from failures as well as successes. Exenatide taught us that brain penetration matters. Not all GLP ones are equal, and we need better ways to predict responses. Now, most experts think we're five to 10 years from having several different disease modifying treatments, not just a cure, but real tools to slow progression. I know five to 10 years sounds like a long time, but this is the period in Parkinson's research where there are the most clinical trials, the most researchers, the most novel ideas and treatments in the pipeline. So it's kind of exciting. So bottom line here, GLP-1 drugs are being tested because they might protect brain cells. Exenatide failed in a major trial, but researchers learned a lot with that failure. Lixacenatide showed promise and continues to be tested in larger trials. These treatments are not available for Parkinson's disease yet, but this represents legitimate science-based research. If it works, it would be significant because we don't have many treatments that actually slow the disease. Most of them are aimed at just treating symptoms. Should you try to go get these yourself? No. Should you stay informed? Absolutely. Like I said, the easiest way is just to subscribe to this channel. As soon as updates come out, I'm going to post a video about it. Should you be hopeful? Yes, but cautiously. I mean, this is really important stuff. Researchers have so many, diff researchers have so many different studies in the works right now. It's only a matter of time before something groundbreaking is found that would change the way Parkinson's is treated. As someone who walked this journey with my mom, I know how desperately we want big breakthroughs. My mom and I, we would watch every video we could find online. We would read all sorts of articles and just really just wanted a ray of, of hope. And you know what? This research is worth watching because there is hope now, but we need to be realistic. Early promise, there's more work needed and there's no guarantees, but we have more scientists working on Parkinson's than ever before. More clinical trials running simultaneously. And we're learning from every single one, even the failures. Each study gets us closer to understanding what works. The fact that multiple GLP-1 drugs are being tested, along with gene therapies, stem cells, and other approaches, means we have more shots on goal than any previous generation. Progress is happening even when it feels slow. Like I said, I'm going to keep following this and I'll update you as soon as some news comes out. Um, if you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others who might find it useful and, inf and informative. Do you have any questions? Have you ever asked your doctor about GLP-1s? Drop a comment below. I read every single comment and I respond to them too. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. And I'll see you in the next video.